Welcome to the online teaching ministry of Pastor Rob Ginter and Farmdale Baptist Church. For more content, visit us online at farmdalebaptist.com. We have all been lied to by Hollywood. But I'm probably not talking about what you think I'm talking about. An article came out in the past uh, couple of weeks, in which, uh, in the last little bit, in which that it exposed the lies of Hollywood. One being, if you're ever being chased by a Tyrannosaurus Rex, don't follow the movies. Because in Jurassic Park, the paleontologist tells them all they need to do is stand still. And he won't see them. Real world paleontologists have proven that is a lie. My wife is like, like, is that true? I was like, I read it on the internet. So, Abraham Lincoln tells us everything is true that we read on the internet. Now, But So this has been revealed as a lie. Not only is it possible for a Tyrannosaurus Rex to see you just fine when an object is still or moving, uh, they're believed to have hawk-like eyesight, or is at least equal to eagles in our day. So here's what that means. If you're ever being chased by a T-Rex, don't stand still. You'll just die faster. (laughs) Don't say it wasn't practical. There you go. But that's not really practical, is it? Because the good news is uh, that you uh, will never likely ever run into a Tyrannosaurus Rex in real life to test the story, this theory. So uh, whether it's a lie or whether it's not a lie, it doesn't really matter, does it? However, there is a lie that's being perpetrated upon the Christian church in our day that really may affect us. And it probably does matter. It does matter. And it's this one. God will never give you more than you can handle. That's the lie. Scripture says that's a lie. God will never give you more than you can handle. In the Scriptures, they actually tell us the exact opposite. God strategically, on purpose, intentionally gives you more than you can handle every day. Every day. You're given far more than you can handle. As we see in the book of James, why? Why does He do that? To prove your genuineness to produce endurance in you, and to perfect you. Because everything you go through is to produce something in you that we saw last week in the book of James. We are constantly trusting God more than we can handle, and that He's doing something inside us. And you go, okay, we're we're a little bit more spiritually mature than uh, dealing with Hallmark cards here. Could be true. However... One reason that you might not pray like you should is because you wouldn't admit it that you believe God would give you more than you can handle, but you live like it in prayerlessness. So we can say we're, we are far beyond that little elementary belief that Christians around our country are believing, but our prayerlessness would attest that to an extent we have given in to the idea that God has given us what we are sufficient in ourselves to handle. Now, we are encouraged to trust God with more than we can handle because of what he is doing. And to be more specific, we're not just to pray in the midst of that, but we are to have joy in the midst of more than we can handle, specifically. He's using what we go through to produce something in us, and we should, as we saw last week, do math that is Christian. 
Christ is our filter for our trials. And what does that do? It allows us to look at trials and drag them over to the category of joy, pure joy. That is what James is telling us to do here in the beginning of his book, to count our trials as all joy. Because of what we looked at last week, the benefits that we saw. And literally, he triples down on why you should do this. Because it will perfect you, meaning that you will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's why you should do this. Because the result of it, the person is, they're genuine, they're walking the path of spiritual endurance and toughness, and what does the destination look like? The destination looks like perfection. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And you hear that destination. And today, you might be staring down the barrel of a trial and saying, I'm pretty far away from that. Pretty far away from perfection, being complete, and lacking in nothing. In fact, I need a lot right where I'm sitting, right where I am with what I'm dealing with. Specifically, I need, namely, I don't know what to do in this situation. Last week we saw what you should do, count all your trials as joy, and we could have all done it in one good two-hour sermon, old-fashioned like, but instead we broke it into a couple weeks. And the second one, the second part of what we see today is how we are to count things as joy, how to view our trials rightly. How do we do that? Only through divine wisdom, divine wisdom, wisdom that is from above. You want joy in trials? You need wisdom from God. And this passage is in our Bible for several reasons, one of which, not only does God command us to consider our trials as pure joy because of what we know God's doing, but he also uh, makes it possible for us to do that. He offers wisdom for trials. He offers wisdom for trials. That's what he does. Now, what is wisdom in trials? That's very vague. Wisdom and trials. Well, James is saturated in the Old Testament throughout, and as we're learning in our Sunday evening Bible study on Proverbs, which you all are invited to, shameless plug, um, wisdom is, our, our working definition for, for our trek through the book of Proverbs is this. Wisdom is learning to live to please God. The skill of learning to live to please God. We see this in verses like Exodus chapter 28, verse 3, and Exodus 31, chapter, uh, verse 3, in which the spirit of wisdom is connected to the skill of building the temple, right? So the wisdom that you have ought to make you able to do some things that God is requiring you to do. Wisdom is skill. This kind of wisdom that we need in trials allows us to please God in trials, so it is God's desire that we would please him as we go through hard times. He has no desire for you to rebel in trouble. His desire is that you please him in trouble. And he also has no desire that you go through trials without him. Because he sets it up, according to verses 5 through 8, so that you go to God in trials. You go to God in trials. So what is the key to wisdom for joy in trials, according to the passage? Prayer. Prayer is the key to wisdom for joy in trials. So to receive wisdom for trials, you should pray, and you should pray from lack. From lack. Look at verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Do you notice that God has no desire for us to go through these things without joy, but with joy through prayer in him? And he starts it in verse 5. What's the context, right? Because normally these are two sermons, but they're normally divorced from each other. And who's the person that needs wisdom? The person that's in trial person that's in the, the furnace of affliction, the person who's in trouble, they need wisdom. 
And why does he start like this? Because you will never pray if you don't believe you lack. You won't ever pray if you believe in your own sufficiency. And unfortunately, many of us do not pray because we do believe in self-sufficiency. In fact, our prayerlessness is what the, our stinky, it's the stink of the breath of self-sufficiency, right? Prayerlessness is the stink of the breath of self-sufficiency. That's what it is. And the, the basis of this text is that you're going to lack wisdom. And, and, and honestly, honestly, how do you know you're lacking something? Because you need it. And how do you know that you need it? You go through trouble. So trials show us that we lack wisdom. It's a trial that comes, pressure that comes, struggle that comes. And it shows us that we have lack. It shows us that we have lack. Think about logically how this works out in our lives. When have you prayed the most? When have you prayed the most? In the darkest night. Beside hospital beds. By deathbeds. In uncertainty. It brings us to face to face with our need. And in that, our weakest moments, we are driven to prayer. Think about when you've prayed the least. When have you prayed the least? Probably during the smoothest times in your life. Things are going great. I assume my prayer life isn't. There's trouble. I assume my prayer life is going to get revved up. Right? We, we see this logically happen because trials expose lack and need for wisdom. Trials drive us to pray. Now, going back to what we see, if we believe that what we've been given is something we can handle, but then we won't pray. So there has to be a shift in order to do this. There has to be a shift. Normally, all the things we go through are competitors for us praying. Right? Like busyness is a competitor to prayer. And social media exposes that that's a lie. Right? Our phones show us that we have time to pray if we would just get off of them. But we believe we don't have time because of all the things that we have going on. So we say things like, I'm too busy to pray. Until, my friends, that there are trials on our to-do list. Trouble comes, pressure hits, struggle is there. They drive us to pray. And it's fitting on a day like this, uh, on Reformation Sunday, Martin Luther worded it like this when he was asked by his friends, what are your plans for the day, for the following day? And he replied, work, work from early until late. He, he replied <laughs> that. And he said, in fact, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. I am so busy today that I have to pray. And you go, that's, that's the dude that nails the, <laughs> the thesis. That's, that's the kind of man that would nail the thesis that he nailed and do the things that he did and stand up against the Pope. That's a man who can go through the diet of worms. Yes, that one. Well, let me tell you, He's just a man like us. He's just a man like us. And he's just a God up, <laughs> that he prayed to that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But look at this attitude for just a second. I have so much to do, I should pray. It's like saying, I have to drive really far. I need to fuel up the tank first because the car's not going to run on fumes. 
But how many of our days run on fumes because of prayerlessness? So instead of things being a competitor for prayer, trials are fuel for prayer. That's the shift that needs to happen. The to-do list is the prayer list. The to-do list creates the prayer list, is the shift that we have to make when we pray from lack, right? We don't look at the day full of ourselves. We look at the day incapable and unable to do any of these things. Who is sufficient for the things of this day? None of us. Therefore, we must pray. We must pray because of that. And and how do we do this? How do we do this? Well, Martin Lloyd-Jones said, we should give ourselves to every inkling to pray. Every inkling. Means you kind of want to do it, do it. Means you hear about it, do it. Means it's almost, yeah, yeah, do it. What's an inkling? It's just a little bitty nudge. Because we know that we have the propensity to to lack and lack in prayer. But if we gave in to every inkling to pray, we would do it a lot more. That's how we would do this. So we do so praying from lack in the passage. We won't have wisdom to please God in the midst of them when we believe that we can handle what's in front of us, but the issue is that we cannot handle anything in front of us, so we always pray from our lack. That's what we do. That's what God is doing in this whole process of perfecting us and growing us, that he's placed us in trials that trust, that, that cause us to trust him. P- place us in trials that cause us to understand our lack and pray from that. Not only that, this isn't reinventing the wheel, but we should pray From lack to God, to God in verse 5. Notice how it continues. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. Who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him, given him. So your eyes are opened in the moment of trial, in the moment of pressure and struggle and hits. Your eyes open, you see the lack, you go to God with it. You go to God. Your eyes are open. And you go to God with it. Now, maybe there's a struggle, a family issue, where there's a rift in a relationship between you and your family. Maybe, maybe that's going on. And you've come to the place where you realize you, you lack wisdom. But you are not in the place to go to God yet. Why? And why would you not go to God? Because you... Of this attitude, I am, don't say your age, fill in the blank years, old, and I've been around the block a time or two, done almost everything a boy could do, I think I can handle this situation. That is a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for disaster. Let me give you an example. There was this guy. And he was stronger than an ox. But he would get himself into the trouble. And he would use his strength to get himself out of the trouble that he got himself into. So he didn't really pray a whole lot. And he, one of his issues is he really liked women. Really, really liked women. Way more than he should have. In fact, all of his friends and all of his family were like, stay away from her. Stay away from her. And he's like, oh, her? I'm going to her house. And they'd say, stay away from her. And he'd go to her house. And eventually, he landed one of these women. And she put him at ease and he fell asleep in her lap. He put, and a grotesque thing happened. She shaved his head. She called for a barber and shaved his head. Here's what she said to Samson. She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep. And you know what he said when he woke from his sleep? He said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. 
And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. You see, Samson was supposed to be God's man, but he trusted in himself and he played with sin and flirted with dis- until his life was like a disaster. Fast forward to his final day. His final day. He was chained up at a Philistine frat party. And he said, and I'll go out like I did before, was changed in the middle of trouble to Lord strengthen me once more. You see the shift there from I'll go out like I did before to strengthen me like just once more. And what, what did it? What, trans- what transformed him? He wasn't praying when the Philistines came on him. He was trusting in his own strength assuming that the Lord would make a way for him in the midst of his own disaster a millionth time, and it didn't happen. The trials brought him to God. And he prayed, God strengthened me once more. And he brought the house down with his great strength, and he killed more on that day of the Philistines than he did in his entire life beforehand. You know why I bring up Samson? Because I'll go out like I did before. Was what sealed his destruction. And it does us too. I'll go out like I did before. I'll shake myself free. I'll trust in my own resources. But you know, God is too good, too gracious, and too loving to let you keep shaking yourself free, that he will bring trials upon you that cause you to turn your eyes to him and to say, strengthen me once more. So in the midst of this, when I say that we need, we need wisdom for trials and how we're going to get it is we're going to pray from our lack and we're going to pray to God, we have to repent of I'll go out like I did before. We turn away from I'll go out like I always did and shake myself free. And we turn towards, Lord, strengthen me once more. I'm incapable. That is what we should do. And and why would we do that? Why would we do that? He goes to God. The trials turn Samson's eyes to God like James is talking about here. Why would we do that? Because of who he is. Look at the second half of verse 5 and verse 6. Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith. So you should ask God for wisdom in prayer because he's not stingy. See, if you look down at your Bibles there, the word generous that he's talking about here is a play on words here in verse 5. Verse 6 says the person who doesn't get his prayer answered is tossed like a wave on the sea. But no, no, not God. Back in verse 5, this generously meaning means he's always there to do it. He's not like, like us, like the wave on the sea. It means unwavering. So God gives wisdom in a way that's unwavering. He's always there, always ready to keep doing it. He stands ready to give wisdom to people in trials. To a select few? Look at the verse. Generously to all. Now in context, he's talking about the people of God. person trusting in him in trials to all of those people without reproach and it will be given him. Have you ever been broke? And some of y'all are like, it's pronounced is. (laughs) Right? It's pronounced is broke. Not was I, it is I. No, see, that's not right either, right? Like is I, I am, right? Have you ever been in trouble Have you ever been been in in need really bad or been broke really bad and and you're just surveying your options, right? You're trying to figure it out. And you know, and you finally figure it out 
and you could, you realize you're going to have to ask somebody for something. You hate that, don't you? But you realize you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to ask them for something. You're going to have to ask somebody for something. And you know, if you go to a certain friend or a certain family member, that they will help you. But they will help you with baggage. Do you have those people in your life that will help you, but they will lay a guilt trip on you, making you feel bad that you needed it in the first place? You ever have those people? You go to them and, and they'll help you. And they'll give you some words of wisdom for why that you're an idiot to get in that situation in the first place. Right? Or you go to those people and they will never let you forget that you, they helped you. They always did. They helped you. So you're going to hear about it, about how silly you are for being in that situation, or you're going to hear about it that they helped you forever. So you have to go down in your mind to figure out, am I that broke to where I'm going to have to ask for that? Or am I in that trouble or am I in that need that I'm going to have to go there and hear that person tell me, berate me for needing something or never let me down, let, let, let me live it down that I needed something? Or can I just stay in trouble? <laughs> right? Can I just stay with lack? Do I really need it that bad? You, you go through your mind and you think about that. So you're stuck trying to figure that out. You might know those people. But my friends, God is not one of those people. He is the one who designed this thing to make it so that you need Him and that He is sufficient for all of your needs. So much so that when you're in trouble, He made it so that you would and you could and you can, you have access to pray. And he does that without reproach, meaning he's not going to demean you for being needy. He's not going to look down on you. He's not going to hang it over your head that he helped you and put the screws to you, so to speak, to where that you just he's going to call a favor in because he helped you five years ago. No. He doesn't do that at all. He gives generously and he does it without demeaning you. He invites you to pray. Just come on and ask. If you're in trouble, you're in need, you're in lack, just come on. No, I'm not going to make you feel bad about being needy. I know, I know that you are far needier than you know. He knows. And he's going to give Wisdom to those in trial, generously, without reproach, without demeaning you, without making you feel bad for asking, my friends. He is not stingy like that. There is one caveat, though, that he offers here in verse 6. What's the caveat? But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. To receive wisdom from trials, you should pray from lack to God in faith. Fairly simple. From lack to God in faith. We trust that we need God's wisdom in trials. Trust that he's the only one he can give it. The interesting thing about James here in verses 6 through 8 is he actually spends more time talking about the person who doesn't get their prayer answered than the person who does. On one hand, you should pray, trusting God to give you wisdom to handle the trial. But the focus is here, the one who doesn't do that. What kind of person 
doesn't expect anything from the Lord, this is the third command that we see here in the book. The first one, count it all joy. The, se the second one, uh, ask God, if you're in trials, for wisdom. And the third command here is, don't suppose. What's the, what's the third imperative there? Don't suppose that you're going to get anything from him if this is you. And then he describes it. So, we look at this. The praying faith is contrasted with the person who doesn't receive anything from the Lord. And what kind of person doesn't receive anything from the Lord that shouldn't suppose that? Well, the person that's curious about God's wisdom, curious to find out if it agrees with you. Right? God, you pray, God gives you wisdom, and you're like, I disagree. And you go on. That's a doubter. Don't expect to receive anything from God. He's not saying if you've ever doubted anything ever, then don't worry about praying. That's not what he's saying. No, this person he describes is a double-minded man. He comes back to this in chapter, verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, when he addresses people who are supposed to be Christians, but have a friendship with both God and the world. And they desire to be friends with God and friends with the world. That's what he, he goes back to, to this concept of double-mindedness in chapter 4, verse 8. And this person who's friends with God, friends with the world, says that's not going to work. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So you can't play both sides. Draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Alistair Begg says this is the kind of person who prays along with Augustine, who says, Lord, make me pure, but not yet. To that person, living to please God is like going on a diet. And I, several of our diets start on Monday. And, and Mondays, and our weeks start on Tuesday. You know what I mean? <laughs> like the, the diet's going to be on Monday, and uh, the calendar now goes Tuesday through Sunday. That's what he's talking about here. The double-minded person that James is describing is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro. He's unstable in all his ways. So this is talking about double-mindedness and unstable uh, instability that affects how we live here. Meaning, this person who's double-minded is not just praying to God and doubting that he'll answer. This spiritual confusion is... Spreading to all his ways. Meaning he's praying to God and asking for something and then living like he wants to. He's praying out of lack and living out of self-sufficiency. Double-minded. And it transfers to how he lives. This person prays one way and lives another way. He prays one way and he lives differently. That's what he's talking about here. Spiritual distraction that spreads to everything he does. That's a person who shouldn't suppose he's going to get anything from God. We see here what's at stake. Do we have focus on God and the world? In worldliness and godliness, those two don't mix. They don't mix. And they hinder our prayer life. Sinclair Ferguson says, to doubt is to be uncertain about God and to feel isolated from Him. To suffer is to experience pain and feel isolated from others. And that's what this person does. In uh, Pilgrim's Progress, which we are taking the kids through, and you can check the book out in the church library, Pilgrim's Progress for Children, I would encourage you to do that. But there is a giant in the book and does anybody know the name of the castle that the giant is in in Pilgrim's Progress? It's Doubting Castle, my friends. Doubting Castle. And there, alone in the darkness, we begin to hear the voices in Doubting Castle that say, there is no help for him in God. There is no help for him in God. Like in Psalm 3. 
No, that's not true. God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. I'm not talking about not planning ahead, right? Not using wisdom to try to plan ahead. I'm saying pray trusting in God and and trusting that you need wisdom from him. He's the only source in order to receive it. We must pray in faith. Hebrews 11 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So if we're praying and keeping our options open or praying one way and living another way, don't expect to receive anything from him. Don't expect that. No, trust Him as we pray for joy and trials. So what should we do to receive wisdom for trials? You should pray from lack to God in faith. That's what we should do. And how do we know if, if we, we got it? What, how does, what do we do after that? You know, I don't know about you, but I've been burned far too many times. Far too many times. And now because of this, I have trust issues. Let me give you one of them. Uh, I'm, I'm in the drive-thru. My wife wants a sausage McMuffin combo with a large pumpkin spice iced coffee. Here I am in the drive-thru. They hand me the bag. I make eye contact with them. Down in the bag I go, my friends. <laughs> Open it up. Burn too many times. Let's see if that sausage McMuffin is in this thing. Yeah, it's there with a the hash brown. Thank you. And I go on. And that, that's a McDonald's order, but I'm talking, it doesn't matter. Like, I, I mean, if, if, if we sent me with a church order, I probably wouldn't check like all 40 sausage biscuits, okay? But like, if, if it's just for us, I'm checking. I'm checking to see if I got what I asked for. That's what I do. I'm going to rummage around until I figure it out. Now, the other day, they gave me the order of the person in front of me. So do with that whatever you want. But, but I ask the question, right? I, I, no shame. I'll do it with eye contact. I don't, I don't care. I, I'm trying to figure out if I got what I asked for. So for us, we're praying in faith from lack to God. How do we know if we got it? How do we know it's in the bag? I spent a lot of time talking about that we ought to be asking for this. So okay, what's it look like when it gets in the bag? What's it really look like? How do we figure out if we have it? Well, that's a great question. Thank you all for asking. All together, you did wonderful we, in, in unison. How, well, if I said we need to, to receive wisdom in trials, that's what we need. For asking for these things, let's go back to our order. Let's go back to the order before we check the bag. What we're looking for? We're looking for wisdom in the midst of trials. So what is wisdom? Living to please God. Well, how do we know how to please God? How do we figure out what pleases God? Well, simply, he has revealed it in his word. So I guess we could define wisdom in the words of James. Later on, in James chapter 1, verse 22, he tells us, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. So the first thing that we would need to do is define wisdom in trials according to James. Let's call it like this. Wisdom is doing the word. Wisdom is doing the word. In a situation. We're asking for it. What is it? Wisdom is doing the word. So we hear the scriptures and we live accordingly in our situation. And how are we going to do that? How are we going to apply God's word in our situation? How are we going to do, God, do the word here in this? Well, my friends, I think we'd have to figure out what it said. We would need to know the word ourselves. But it's not just knowing the word individually, right? It's not individual understanding here. Proverbs 13, 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise 
becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So there is wisdom in community, right? So through wise counsel, we can understand how to do the word. Through wise counsel, we need more than our brain. We need to walk with the wise in this room. Like really walk with each other. Really share situations and try to figure out how to do the word in that situation. Hence why this is talking about wisdom in community. And our church covenant back there has all kinds of one another's in it. So when you join Farmdale, you read that thing, and most of it is about what you're supposed to do for somebody else. Or what somebody's supposed to do for you. What you do for each other. That the scriptures command. One of the commands of scripture is that we ought to walk with the wise. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Meaning like, if you want to be a fool, separate yourself. If you want to go towards folly, Separate yourself from walking with the wise. And just be by yourself. That's where folly lives. In your own brain, all by yourself. So don't connect with people in the church if you want wisdom. But if you want wisdom, get it through wise counsel. Get it through the scriptures together. He goes on to say in that next verse in Proverbs chapter 18, that a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only expressing his opinion. So that means that we need more voices in the room than our own. And that's why we walk in the word with the wise. And notice also that we should work it out. This is how we know if we've got wisdom and trials, if, if we work through them. This is a directional component, meaning this isn't just knowledge. He's saying if you're in trials, don't try to just get information. No, you need information with direction. And how do we know that we have wisdom? It changes our direction. It, there is an affection, AF, affection of our direction in our life. Proverbs 9, wisdom is personified as a woman crying out. 9, 4, whoever's simple, turn in here. Wisdom from God turns you, my friends. It turns you. Wisdom changes your direction. Are you ready for a change in direction? You know, wisdom is personified elsewhere in the scriptures, as you all know. Finally and fully in the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostles' audience, aren't, aren't, they're looking for wisdom. The wisdom of the age, like it's like acquiring popular opinion. It says the Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom. Paul said, for Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block for Jews and folly for Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. What is the wisdom of God in the Word of God? Who is the wise, the walking with the wise point you to? And what does wisdom look like when it's worked out? It looks like the Lord Jesus Christ and being conformed to His image. You see, we in our foolishness, we rejected God thinking that we were wiser than Him. God became a man in Jesus Christ. The power of God and the wisdom of God come to a world of foolish rebels. And what does He do? He cries aloud, Whoever simple, turn in here! And it sounds something more like, the kingdom of heaven has come, repent and believe. We turn from trusting in our own wisdom and bank our life solely on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ alone. 
He died on the cross in our place to take our punishment and wrath from God, and he rose on the third day victorious over everything. He commands that you would understand your lack. Go to God in faith to trust solely in God become man in the person of Jesus. This isn't talking about somebody who says, says they trust in Christ while they live however they want to. James would tell us that that's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. No, no, there isn't a backup plan. There isn't a partial solution. This is wholehearted belief in the person of the Lord Jesus, who he is and what he does. Ask him to forgive you of your folly, forgive you of your rebellion against God, and grant you everlasting life with him the moment you believe. You know how the wisdom of God is. It is, would be, it is alive in the Christian to change you, to guide you, and direct you. And if you want that, Let's pray from lack to God in faith. Father, thank you so much for your son who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I pray that you would uh, allow us to walk together in wisdom, to work out this wisdom practically, and let it change all of our lives to conform us to your son. We trust you, the only wise God, and ask that you do these things for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.